saw in the scripture reading, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 18 tonight. In a couple of weeks, I was asked to speak at a group in a special series on a Wednesday about the miracle of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And the title of their series is So That You May Know, where they're examining the different miracles that have occurred throughout the span of the Bible and asking, what are we supposed to learn from them? So in some ways, you're my test audience for this, so let me know if it's terrible. But today we're going to be talking about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, the miracle that occurred there. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, uh, but hopefully we gain a new appreciation. So first, as we think about it, what was the context of this miracle, if you think it? In order to fully understand what the inspired author is showing us in this story, I think we need to go back to chapter 16 when Ahab becomes king of Israel. So if you don't know, Ahab is a very bad guy. And when we get to 1 Kings 16, this is one of the first discussions about him. It says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. And really that last sentence is what we want to key in on. This is who we are encountering in this story. This has been the worst king to pop up so far. He has done more in terms of his idolatry than any king so far. Ahab is described as worse than every previous king, and most importantly, in God's eyes, not the people's. And if you didn't know, Ahab's lineage is actually what popularized Baal worship in Israel. His family is the reason that it became such a problem. With his practice and also his marriage to Jezebel, who was a Phoenician princess who brought all of this stuff into Israel, and his daughter, Athaliah, another not great person in Scripture, is credited with making Baal worship a serious problem in Judah. Their family has perhaps more repercussions than any. The, the Omri dynasty, of course, is notorious for being terrible anyway, but Ahab had a very particular hand in that. Now, just a note about Baal, because some of us might know what that is, some of us might not. It is kind of, he takes different forms, but it was sort of like a supreme god of the people in that area. He was a fertility and a storm god. So his power over the storms and rain were linked to the fertility of the land, bringing forth agriculture and animals. And so to incite Baal's activity, there would sometimes be human sacrifices, according to some accounts, but there would also be fertility practices or orgiastic worship to incite his activity. And so you can see some of the mess that that caused in Israel. That is what we're dealing with. And as a result of Ahab's wickedness, God announces through Elijah a severe drought. And Elijah says, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my word. Of course, that's famous, and that's picked up in the New Testament where we see James talk about that. But this is really important, because remember what Baal was supposed to have power over? The weather and agriculture. And we see this is sort of the beginning of the miracle that we're going to talk about, because by causing this drought, God, through Elijah, is offering a direct challenge to Baal, 
and his followers about who is really in power. And that is the narrative that I want you to see carried through this. That God is directly challenging these other gods, basically to show them who's in charge. During this time, Elijah encounters the widow of Zarephath, where he causes her flour and her oil not to run out. And when she sees all of this, she says, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, or the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. So there's all of this craziness going on. There's the worship of the Baal. Things are seemingly as bad as they've ever been. But we find this one lowly widow sort of tucked away that is able to see that God is still active, that Elijah is his prophet, and that is central to this. It's not as though God's not there and he's totally lost. He is recognizable to people who are looking for him. Some people were still able to see it. And this widow was one of them. But when we talk about what happened around the miracle, sort of that was the lead up to it. What happened around the miracle, if you sort of scan these chapters, is that Jezebel, Ahab's wife, had been killing off the prophets of Yahweh God, the God of Israel, and they wanted to kill Elijah too. Some faithful people were hiding the prophets, which is mentioned of Obadiah here. But we see, as is told to Elijah, as surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master, Ahab, has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. They are hunting Elijah down. They want nothing more than to kill him. And when Elijah confronted King Ahab, he made clear that this trouble for the nation was because of Ahab's rebellion in serving the Baals. And we get later in chapter 19... When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, the one ruining Israel? And he replied, I have not ruined Israel, but you and your father's family have, because you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. And then this is really the challenge. Now summon all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So think about this. This drought and the resulting famine is directly a result of what Ahab has led this nation to do. He clearly doesn't see that. Elijah says this drought is not going to end until I say it ends. And you are the one who's ruining everything. And now he's going to challenge him about that. And that brings us really to the miracle. So a few verses later, Elijah sets the rules for the competition. And this is sort of his first summary of it. Elijah said to them, and keep in mind, this is the king and probably the elders of Israel and all of these prophets, which is essentially several hundred to one. I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us, let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves, and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. This is the challenge that is brought. So... Yahweh God has directly attacked Baal, challenging his power, and now is really the competition to say, who is the real God? Elijah let the prophets of Baal choose their ox first, set their sacrifice, and call to Baal first. He gave them every advantage they could possibly have. He tipped the scales completely in their favor. But if we look at verse 29, after they had gone the entire day with just ecstatic, frantic practices. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. 
No one answered. No one paid attention. And that's arguing about their God. There was nobody there. Throughout the whole day, trying to get his attention and seek his favor and show that he was powerful, some of the versions will say there was not a sound. Nothing happened. Baal, even with every advantage, was nowhere to be found. At Elijah's turn, he rebuilt God's altar using 12 stones to represent the whole nation of Israel, which you can see mentioned in verses 30 and 31. And we'll talk about this later, but I want to mention now that I think this was to symbolize that he was restoring the worship of God to Israel. But he told his servants to fill pitchers of water and pour them all over the offering and the altar three times. And there was no way you could light a fire on that. That was the point. Clearly, this Yahweh God is going to be at a disadvantage. Because how is anybody going to do that? But when it was time, Elijah prayed and God acted. And as was read for us, at the time for the offering, time for offering the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant, and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. So what we should see there is Yahweh, the God of Israel, and his prophet Elijah have won. The competition is over. But we need to talk about what this miracle showed. What are we supposed to learn from this? And so first, in talking about what this showed, it showed that Israel... It showed Israel their sin in abandoning God. Remember what Elijah had said to Ahab. If you look back at verse 18, he said, I have not troubled Israel, you have. Because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. And because of we should, a lot of pressure, the people followed him. God wanted them to be convicted about their rebellion. And so, as we see in verse 21, then Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. This word rendered waver or limping, as some of yours might have it, has this idea of an injury where the people are just aimlessly hobbling back and forth, not making any real commitments. And Elijah says, figure out who God is and follow him. Stop wavering back and forth between this. And so the next thing that Israel is supposed to see from this miracle is that the Lord is God. We see clearly that Yahweh wanted to make it absolutely clear who was in power. Baal was not in power. He was nothing. And so we saw that in this verse where Elijah is calling them, if the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. That's a pretty honest statement, right? Elijah says, if you find Baal to be the one in power, then go follow him. But the people are bouncing back and forth. And we see in verse 24, in the midst of the challenge where 
Elijah tells them, then you call on the name of your God. I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers with fire. He is God. So that's what this is about. Displaying who was actually in charge. For one, who caused this drought? Who has the power to stop it? Who is the one that we should be following? Who is the true God? And that's what they're looking for here. They say, sound like fine terms to me. But as we read, at the time for the offering, Elijah's prayer that we've read a couple times now, Elijah says in verse 37, Answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Remember that this drought was already a direct challenge, not only to Baal, but to Ahab and Jezebel, to their prophets. Yahweh was showing that what was happening in the land was completely under his control, and a judgment against their disloyalty and their rebellion. Elijah gave the Baalists all the advantages He put his sacrifice at a disadvantage, all to make the victory of God that much more striking. And to show more clearly that he is a true prophet speaking on behalf of God. So when his warnings come forth, that's something that they need to listen to. As we said, these few chapters are written to display a competition between Yahweh and Baal of which this miracle and the restoration of the rain a few verses later, if you scan 41 and 45, are the climax of the victory for the God of Israel. And we see that in seeing God's glorious power, the people can only confess this one is God. And so we see that, that God wanted them to understand that they had sinned in abandoning him, that the Lord is God. Now here, let's look at some applications from this. And as was said, this was thousands of years ago. These are talking about fake gods made out of metal. But let's look and see if there is anything that we can learn here. God wants us to learn, first and foremost, that he is awesome. And you can mean that in the casual way, too. I think it still works. But the point is that Yahweh is different. He is awesome. God clearly displayed his greatness for the people to see. So there would be no confusion about who was in control, not Baal, the God of Israel. And this is the same God that we serve today who calls us into a relationship with him. He shut up the Baalists, he raised Jesus from the dead, and he's with us today. And if that doesn't make the hair on your arm stand up, you need to do some searching inside. That this God who did these things, who parted the Red Sea, whatever you want to fill in the blank, is the same one who is calling you to himself and wants to have a relationship with you. That, I think, is first and foremost. But also, I think God wants us to learn from this story that he is gracious and he is merciful. And maybe that one's not as apparent to you. If you pay close attention to the beginning of Elijah's sacrifice, I think there's some details that we shouldn't miss. Remember, in verse 21, Elijah says, you need to follow God, whichever one he is they had the opportunity to repent and return. That's the first indication of that. This is all happening so that the people will see who God is and turn to him. When Elijah rebuilds the altar that had been torn down, and we can say presumably through Jezebel's crusade, and he uses 12 stones, it says, to symbolize the whole nation, 
I think Elijah is speaking to the fact that he is restoring the worship of Yahweh back to Israel. He's giving them an opportunity to go back and to be loyal once again to the covenant that they had made. And that's one, I think, maybe between the lines that we can miss easily. Remember Elijah's prayer also. In verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And what do we usually say that is? Repentance. God is calling these people to repent. In his graciousness, in his mercy, he wants them to return to him. And he's giving them the opportunity to do so. And that sounds all well and good, but then you say, hold on. Right after this, Elijah goes and slaughters all of the priests. How is that gracious? Because that's not something that we can skip over. There's different opinions about that detail. But I want to note, Elijah acted according to the consequences of the covenant that God and Israel had made together. If you read in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, he says, Don't follow them, and drop down to verse 5, but that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. It is laid right there in black and white. They were not ignorant of this fact. This was what they agreed to as a nation. And what they willingly went into when they followed the Baals. And God, in his graciousness, carried out the agreement of the covenant. And that might sound counterintuitive to us. I think this might be one of the best explanations that I've heard of it. I was going to put it on the slides, but I forgot. So just try to listen closely. We read verse 40 and go into moral hysterics. We simply don't get it. The problem is not with Elijah or the Old Testament, but with us. We react the way we do because in our subliminal view, apostasy is not that big of a deal. We simply don't understand Yahweh's violence against rebellion in his people. He uses surgery, not breath mints, on cancer. The problem is not God's lack of refinement but our lack of sanctification. That was written by a man named Dale Ralph, Ralph Davis, and I, I had thought about that for quite a while because I had not heard anybody really state it that way, but I think, I think that's what it is. We have to understand the severity, for one, of what's going on here, that people's souls are being perverted, that God is in this covenant relationship with them where he has laid out the conditions very clearly and they have transgressed that. And I'll tell you honestly, I don't like that. I don't like that those 450 people had to die. But I'm also not God. And that's something that we need to discuss, and I'll be happy to talk about that later. But on a happier note, switching gears a little bit, God also wants us to learn that his glory demands our loyalty. Why was all of this done? Because it was expected that when the people were confronted with the might of God, that they would turn and serve him. There was an expectation when they met God, that they would serve him. And that's what it says in verse 21 of chapter 18. Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God... Follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. 
there's an expectation that when we see God for who He is, we'll treat Him as He is and give our lives to Him. I think that's a little bit foreign in our day and age where people might say something like, I like God or I like Jesus, but they don't do anything with it. That's much more common, but that's foreign to the Scriptures. And I think also we can learn this here, that there's an expectation to respond to what God has done and serve Him. We can see that in this story, but I want to suggest that we can see it even more clearly in the cross. The same principle. That there is an expected response to what God has done. When we see God for who He is, hanging for us, what are we going to do about it? There are many other applications that we could make from this event, but I hope that you find those three helpful. As we start to wrap this up, we see the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal is one that children are taught, that many believers are familiar with, but I hope that viewing it in the way that we did, that we can gain some new appreciation for why God might have preserved this event for his people to read. There's something to learn. That's why it's there. Only Yahweh is God. And we might need that, not need that lesson as directly today as the people did then. We don't always see people bowing down to statues, but it does still happen in parts of the world. But there are still things that can call us away in the exact same way that the idols did back then. And we need to remember that only the Lord is God. He is the only one with the power. He is the only one able to save us. We see from this miracle that God has always and still wants our worship, our trust, and our loyalty. That's what he wanted from these people. He might have demonstrated that then through the fire from heaven on Elijah's sacrifice, but he has demonstrated it once and for all that he wants our worship, our trust, and our loyalty in his son, Jesus Christ. He doesn't have to do this stuff anymore. He doesn't have to call down fire from heaven in front of people because he's done everything that he possibly could have. And again, it's in the cross, and it's in the empty tomb, and it's in the man floating to the right hand of heaven. God has done everything. And the question is, how are we going to respond to it? That discussion of God's glory, I think, has to put some feelings of awe inside you. That feeling is supposed to translate into faith and service. And again, if there's a hang up there, if there, I understand what God did and I see who he is, for one, I don't think we really understand God all that well if it's not motivating us to do something about it. But if we feel like we do understand and there's a hang up and we're not motivated to have a response, we have to do some searching about that, some talking and confessing our faults. So as you begin to get ready to sing the song that was chosen for us, I want to ask that, are you curious about that kind of commitment that we've just talked about? Have you decided that you're ready to take that step? We, as always, have an opportunity while we sing the song for someone to come forward, if that's the way that they wish to do it, to express whatever they need whether that is to be baptized or that is to confess a fault or to ask for help. But we'll also be standing in the back and we'll be here in the pews if you want to talk to somebody. Whatever it is, take this moment to think about what you need to do as we stand and sing.